Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third LSE Africa Summit. This day has been long awaited. As co-director of the LSE Africa Summit, I deeply, I'm deeply honored and privileged to stand before you today to welcome you to the business conference, theme, Thinking Beyond Investment. Haven't spent my early life in Africa. I'm amazed at how the continent has been able to harness and mobilize businesses who have been able to advance our economy in an increasingly globalized world. It is an important and significant milestone that students at LSE are able to put together a platform in which prominent leaders, policymakers, and experts from Africa can share lessons learned and continuously move forward towards impact investment. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to call to the stage the director of the LSE, Professor Craig Cohn, to deliver welcome remarks. Well, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, excellent students, my LSE colleagues, it's a pleasure to be able to greet you this morning. And it is my honor to welcome you to the third edition of the LSE Africa Summit. The LSE Africa Summit is an annual student-led initiative. And when I say student-led, the students do all the work. A few of us, people with white hair, try to offer support and advice. But from the very beginning, students have organized and made this summit happen. And this is appropriate because these students are the future, and the summit is about the future as well as about the present. The LSE Africa Summit provides a forum for discussing key advances and issues in Africa. Yesterday, there was a research-led conference with academic papers by students from several universities, young researchers, faculty from other places, bringing the best kinds of new knowledge to a variety of issues. Today, the conference continues with the exploration beyond investment as the theme on issues of business and economic development in Africa, discussing, even debating when appropriate, issues of prosperity, the role of philanthropy, and the overall possibilities for African development. We explore Africa within a global discourse, not as an isolated, separate part of the world, but as an increasingly globally important part of the world. African development is interdependent with global development. It involves action in countries on all parts of the continent, relationships with the African diaspora, but also relationship with international capital flows and investment, with educational institutions like the LSE, and in short, with the whole world. The summit seeks to examine how nations in Africa can capitalize on opportunities. More specifically, going beyond simply seeking investment, that is, measuring success in terms of the pounds or euros or dollars that are invested, and instead measuring success in terms of the actual human improvements, the actual policy successes, and the social changes that are produced. Discussions in this two-day period range from social media, the politics of knowledge in higher education, to gender, the question of whether there is a global land grab taking place, China-Africa relations, finance, energy, technology, and telecommunications, human capital, and philanthropy. These include many pressing questions, but don't exhaust the pressing questions that face leaders in Africa today. The LSE Africa Summit has developed into an important forum for this discussion about Africa and its future. And it's appropriate that this should happen at LSE. 
This is a very unusual school. We have students from more than 150 countries. This is an enrichment to the education of each. It means that more even than many universities on the continent of Africa, students meet their colleagues from other African countries. Zambians meet South Africans and Kenyans and Nigerians and Congolese. The knitting together of educational experience is part of the knitting together of a capacity for future collaborative work. And this extends globally. Students learn something different when they are in seminars with colleagues who come from Russia and Colombia, Canada, and Egypt. They ask different questions. They learn to see things through the eyes of others. And this is part of the strength of an LSE education. At the same time, in this remarkable experience of international collaboration, there is also an emphasis on high quality research-based knowledge. Not just opinions are debated, but real knowledge and the effort to understand practical issues from urbanization to climate change, finance to global health. The LSE has a long history of deep engagement with Africa. Through the first three quarters of the 20th century, LSE educated many students who became leaders in independent struggles, post-colonial transitions, the Pan-African movement, and building new countries. There are a range of presidents and prime ministers around the continent attended LSE. This was partially interrupted, however, by the shortages of hard currency that followed on the 1974-75 economic crisis, the shift in prices of petroleum, and the challenge to global cooperation. We have moved more recently to renew this relationship. LSE has been the home to literally hundreds of researchers working in and with Africa, looking at critical issues through a social science lens, and informing national and international debates. We maintain offices in several African countries through the International Growth Center to provide connections between leading thought in global economics and practical policy making in specific contexts. And we have more than doubled, in fact nearly tripled, the number of African students at the LSE and we regard this as just a beginning. I would like to highlight in particular the LSE's program for African leadership. Director Tim Allen is here, generously funded by the Lalji family. PFAL has already welcomed over 120 African students, offering them an LSE academic education and leadership training to help them achieve aspirations for their home countries, and also a continuing network linking them across national borders in Africa. The LSE is also a world-leading research university, and impressively much of this high-impact research has a focus on Africa. By one measurement, a quarter of all of the highest impact rated research from the LSE has a connection to Africa. I'm very pleased to report that the school has created the LSE Africa Center as a new platform for research, teaching, and engagement with the continent. With LSE's global outlook as part of its founding orientation, its mission is to help our faculty, students, alumni, and partners in Africa to create knowledge, educate leaders, and collect evidence for policymakers in support of a prosperous African future. The Africa Center will aim to engage more genuinely with African voices from academia and other parts of society and with business leaders in its internal debates and in its ability to make external connections to foster African viewpoints in global debates. But let us move on with the Africa Summit. Today, we are very honored to welcome a number of dignitaries to the LSE. Her Excellency Inongawina, Vice President of Zambia, is about to speak to us. We are very pleased 
Later in the day, we will hear from Akinwumbi Ambode, the governor of Lagos State, Nigeria, and His Excellency Atiku Abubakar, the former vice president of Nigeria and a leading businessman and philanthropist. As part of the discourse of Africa within a global context, we've created a special session on leadership for African prosperity. This special session will be chaired by one of our very own, Dr. Vanessa Iwowo, a fellow of the LSE Department of Management. She will explore the concept and realities of African prosperity with Her Excellency Inongawina. After the lecture, there will be Q&A open to the audience. And for all the LSE students in the audience, I remind you that part of your job and the LSE's long tradition is to ask hard, challenging questions. But I'll also remind you that in order to be hard and challenging, questions do not need to be long. <laughs> now, may I introduce Her Excellency Inongo Matuko Wina. Inongo Wina is a key leader in Zambia and in Africa more generally. She's worked in government as a civil servant and a politician, a passionate woman's rights advocate. She volunteered on various boards. She has been the chair of the NGO Coordinating Council. She has held many ministerial positions. And since 2015, she has been the vice president, the highest ranking woman in the history of Zambia, and a key leader for women and for all Africans. Please join me in welcoming you. Good morning, everyone. Professor Craig Cahoon, Dr. Tim Allen, Director of the African Center, His Excellency, the High Commissioner of the Republic of Zambia, co-directors of the LST Africa Summit, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. LSE has a long history with Zambia. Our first leader of any African uh, political movement in Zambia, Mr. Harry Mwanga Nkumbula, was a student here in the early 50s. And since then, we have had students from Zambia as part of the academic community of LSE. So allow me from the outset to thank the conveners of this important meeting for inviting me to this auspicious summit whose theme is Africa within a global context, thinking beyond investment. A well-chosen theme indeed, particularly now when the continent of Africa is finding its feet on the global arena and seek homegrown investment solutions. It is truly an honor for me to be amongst accomplished scholars academicians, and business leaders today. As you are aware, 
Africa is not one country, but a continent that comprises 54 countries. And therefore, I will speak as one of many African leaders in general, and as Vice President of the Republic of Zambia. Now to talk a bit about globalization, ladies and gentlemen. Generally, globalization refers to the opening of domestic and nationalistic perspectives to a broader outlook of an interconnected and the interdependent world moving towards economic, financial, trade, and communication integration characterized by an impeded transfer of capital, goods, and services across national frontiers. Globalization has presented opportunity for Africa to exploit market opportunities around the world through easier movement of goods, services, technology across borders and overseas. However, globalization has also come with challenges where Africa remains a source of raw and unprocessed commodities, and yet imports finished products. I think that is a contradiction that needs to be challenged and interrogated. It is for this reason that African leaders through Agenda 2063 under the African Union resolved to take steps to learn from past lessons and build unto current progress and exploit opportunities available in the short term, medium, medium term, and the long term to even the playing field and ensure positive social economic transformation for all Africans. We therefore see investment as a critical piece of the wider puzzle, including value addition and industrialization, whose ultimate goal is social economic development, job and wealth creation for our people. Admittedly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in order for Africa to leverage its strengths and benefit from its engagement with the rest of the world, and unlock Africa's latent potential, there are pertinent issues that we need to address, such as infrastructure, human capital development, and good governance, to mention but a few. We have learned from history that in the late 19th century, there was a scramble for Africa where economic powers of the West, such as Great Britain, France, and Germany, among others, fought for economic control and influence of territories within the resource-rich African continent and that defined the relationship between Africa and Europe, and contextualized Africa's position 
in the world. Today, however, the partnership between Africa and the rest of the world has changed and is now anchored on mutual respect and mutual benefit. You will agree with me that having gone through different periods of transformation from pre-colonial and the colonial times through struggles for independence and political liberation and pan-Africanism, from nationalization of industries and the import substitution for privatization, from structural adjustment programs and the highly indebted poor countries initiative, or HIPIC, in short, to regional integration, Africa has devolved capabilities and a demonstrated capacity to weather economic storms. Even during the regional financial crisis elsewhere, Africa continued to register positive economic growth. <coughs> Regrettably, the reported economic growth has had little impact on poverty alleviation and has not benefited the local people, mainly because the profits are not plowed back into the local economy, principally because the profits are externalized. I believe most of you who attended the lectures of yesterday must have uh, grabbed something from this particular explanation as to why African economies are being deprived of essential revenues from its natural resources. You will have to agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that Africa remains a shining star even in an uncertain global economic environment because of the vast natural resources that the continent is endowed with. The challenge I wish to throw to you, scholars, academicians, and the researchers, is to come up with economic development <laughs> models that will ensure that African natural resources are exploited in a manner that benefits Africans. And also, to redefine what economic growth is in the African context. I also must acknowledge that African leaders have been resolute and pulled together to promote social economic upliftment of the African people. Ladies and gentlemen, at Pan-African level, under the stewardship of the African Union, and at regional level such as SADIC, COMESA, ECOWAS, the East African community, etc., and indeed at bilateral level, a lot of work is being done to maintain security peace and political stability, and enhance good governance and electoral democracy. In this connection, African leaders at the AU summit in February 2010 proclaimed a policy of zero tolerance 
for coup d'etat and other forms of violation of democratic standards. Although there are a few trouble spots of political instability on the continent, there are many good examples of peacefully elected democratic governments. Zambia, for instance, has in the last 50 years since independence had six presidents elected through peaceful, free, and fair elections, and also peaceful transfer of power. Further, my country has participated in peacekeeping missions around Africa and actively participated in addressing conflict in the Great Lakes region. Zambia played a leading role in resolving the Angolan conflict by bringing the rival parties together, which led to the signing of the 1994 Lusaka Peace Accord between the ruling MPLA and the rebel movement UNITA. In 1999, Zambia as chair of the regional initiative for peace in the Democratic Republic of Congo facilitated the signing of the Lusaka ceasefire agreement by seven countries, namely Angola, Congo DRC, Namibia, Rwanda, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. You will be interested to note, ladies and gentlemen, that women constitute about half of the population in Africa. And it would therefore be uh, perilous for the continent to ignore the invaluable contribution women make towards social economic development and poverty alleviation, given the opportunity to be in political and decision-making positions. And in this regard, many African countries have adopted and domesticated principles of gender equality, propelled by fora such as the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action of 1995, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women CEDAW of 1979, the AU Solemn Declaration on Gender Equality in Africa of 2004, and the SADC Declaration on Gender and Development and they continue to implement strategies to achieve the agreed targets of 50-50 gender representation in political and decision-making positions. I must mention, however, that women in comparison to their male counterparts face challenges and many challenges, and among these are resource constraints to effectively participate in politics. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, side by side with the efforts to improve gender parity in govern governance structures, is the deliberate women empowerment schemes including skills training and capacity building, facilitation of access to affordable loans or capital at concessionary uh, rates of interest, and market access for their products. Further, 
African governments have taken steps to improve access to education for the girl child, address issues of child early and forced marriages, teenage pregnancies, and reintegration into school, and maternal health as part of the overall strategy to empower young women and build a cadre of women that can assume positions of leadership in their respective communities. In Africa, we have, or rather, we are privileged to have a useful population that provides a huge pool of potential skilled manpower to drive the economic growth and they create the necessary demand market with the emergency of a middle class. In Zambia, government formulated a national youth policy in partnership with the youth and the other key stakeholders to provide the youth with equal access to opportunities that enable them to grow, develop, and prosper as fully engaged, responsible, patriotic, and productive citizens. The key policy priority areas under which interventions have been crafted include employment and entrepreneurship development, education and skills development, health and cultural creative industries and sport. In this regard, a number of technical and vocational training institutes have been established, while others have been upgraded to universities in order to cater for the skills needed for industry, having adopted the industrialization policy to resuscitate the manufacturing sector to generate required jobs and business or entrepreneurial opportunities for the young people. I am happy to report that in Zambia, government has also established multi-facility economic zones, or MFES, to encourage establishment of high value adding industries, while industrial parks at provincial levels are being established for setting up primary and medium sized manufacturing plants. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, the theme of this summit says Africa within a global context, thinking beyond investment. But I want to, to add that public investment in infrastructure, education and health complemented by private sector led investment in business uh, in business enterprises are critical to include growth and sustainability in the recent past however zambia and the other african governments have invested heavily in infrastructure as good infrastructure attracts quality investment. Examples of infrastructure projects include the Link Zambia 8000 road project. In Kenya, the 310 megawatt Lake Tukana wind power project, and the 6000 Grand Ethiopian uh, Renaissance Dam project, to mention but a few. While foreign direct investment, or FDI, 
in key priority sectors has been a driving force in Zambia's economic growth, particularly in the mining sector. As Africans, we need to start looking inward for homegrown investment solutions to support our own diversification. It is an acknowledged fact, ladies and gentlemen, that the agricultural sector has great potential for good production with the abundant land that we have in Africa, water resources, and fair weather. Africa could be the food basket of the world. As such, the Zambian government, for example, has prioritized the agricultural sector and the agro-processing for value addition of the produce to improve the value chain and generate more income for the farmers and create more jobs for the youth. However, we need to be mindful of the adverse effect of climate change and the need to mobilize financial and technical resources in order to enhance our preparedness to mitigate the impact of global warming and climate change. More importantly, we have a responsibility and they owe it to our future generations to preserve the natural environment because that is our common heritage. I must use this forum to call upon our brothers and sisters in the diaspora to invest back in their respective home countries and be part of the transformation. And I hope students from LSE after graduation will bear this in mind. Evidence has shown that in some countries, remittances from the diaspora far exceed aid received. And that shows you the strength that lies within us as a people. It is homegrown as well as foreign investments by Africans across African borders, such as Dangote Group and many others that will bring sustainable social economic development to our African countries. Ladies and gentlemen, small and medium-sized enterprises make substantial contribution to job and wealth creation. However, their growth is often constrained by lack of access to affordable financing. And in this regard, there is need to find ways for delivering affordable credit to small and medium-sized enterprises such as microfinance institutions. <clears throat> Although microfinance is still in its infancy in Zambia, it has helped to bridge the gap and provide easily accessible credit to small and medium-sized enterprises. Thus, while the Zambia Development Agency has provided non-monetary assistance to companies setting up business through the single window, institutions such as the Citizens Economic Empowerment Commission has helped to provide funds to small and medium-sized enterprises for bankable projects. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Africa continues to face the
the challenges of inadequate infrastructure. Although governments have tried their best to invest uh, in infrastructure, lack of proper infrastructure adds to the cost of doing business in Africa. Making African products uncompetitive on the global market. There is need, therefore, for concerted efforts to mobilize resources for pan-African and regional infrastructure projects in Africa. In this regard, finding the requisite innovative financing modalities and the leveraging of resources for financing Africa's infrastructure development need, uh, development needs could play a pivotal role in bridging the gap. And in order to enhance the competitiveness of African products, there is need to reduce the cost of doing business, which is relatively high compared to the developed world due to a number of factors, such as bureaucratic licensing and the regulatory formalities, poor infrastructure and the logistics, and the high cost of ICT. There is also need to address issues of non-tariff barriers and the market restrictions that African exports are subjected to. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished audience, in terms of ICT and the ICT connectivity, Zambia is currently connected to the worldwide undersea optic fiber uh, cable via Namibia, Tanzania, South Africa, and Mozambique. I think you are aware that Zambia is a landlocked country, but in Zambian terms, we always say is a land connected country because we are surrounded by eight countries. This has led to reduction in costs of internet and data services, thus lowering the cost of doing business. Admittedly, technology has helped to facilitate commercial and financial transactions within the country and beyond. Today, businesses can make and receive payments through various electronic media. A number of government and business processes are now conducted online and the speedy but informed decisions are made after uh, data mining and analysis using software packages and the electronic platforms. In this regard, trade facilitation, government revenue collection, security, communication, healthcare, education and planning are some of the areas that have improved significantly owing to the use of ICT. There is, however, need to use technology to broaden the tax base and improve compliance. <coughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there's no doubt in my mind that technology has helped to accelerate social economic development in Zambia and the wider Africa, but more work needs to be done to widen coverage and they increase accessibility to ICT. My government is in the process of implementing 
an e-governance strategy that will further enhance efficiency in government service delivery. Energy is another very current topic in Africa, especially uh, South Central Africa, where I come from. Energy or power is the lifeline of an economy. The energy sector plays a catalytic role in economic development, and many sectors depend on power to develop and grow in one way or another. As you can imagine, even the little things we take for granted in our own homes, offices, and elsewhere depend on power. Unfortunately, many countries in Africa and parts of the world still experience power outages mainly because of insufficient power generation and transformation, transmission capacity to meet the existing demand. In the case of Zambia, for example, the opening up of new mines and the expansion of existing mining operations has substantially increased demand for power. And yet, owing to the development agreement signed over 20 years ago with the mines that consume more than 50% of the power generated in Zambia, the electricity tariffs remained stagnant and uneconomical leaving little resources to increase power uh, generating capacity in the country. You will be interested to learn that Zambia is endowed with a wide range of energy resources, namely hydropower, coal, and other renewable sources of energy such as solar. The country's hydropower resource potential stands at an estimated 6,000 megawatts or even more. Wheels installed capacity is only at 2,332 megawatts. So the demand for electricity has on average been between 1,500 to 2,000 megawatts annually due to, among other factors, increased mining and industrial activities, agriculture and domestic demand resulting in power deficit. In view of this, I see great investment opportunities for both local and foreign investors in this sector, particularly in the use of renewable energy sources such as solar, geothermal, and wind power. Africa has the greatest potential in solar power generation because of excellent sun hours for insulation. In Africa, we hardly talk about the weather. But I notice in, in Britain, uh, this is a very topical issue on daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> My government has embarked on major solar projects to augment hydropower generation, which is vulnerable to changing weather patterns due to the effect of global warming. We have also started the process of reviewing energy tariffs 
towards cost reflective tariffs in order to attract investment in this sector. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, another key prerequisite to taking advantage of globalization is the skills development and the research and the development. And this is uh, beyond investment. Africa's human cap capital is the most precious resource. Currently, low levels of investments in human capital, particularly in education, innovation, in research and skills development on the continent, has been significant to make the requisite inroads on the economic growth resulting in a shortage of various skills needed to respond to the needs of industry on the continent. Africa intends under its Agenda 2063 to address these challenges by increasing investments in these areas we see great potential for private sector participation in these sectors. Unemployment on the continent of Africa, and indeed in Zambia, has continued to be very high, particularly among the young people. And to reverse this trend, Africa needs to make deliberate sustained investments in education, science, technology, research, and skills development. The youth on the continent need to be equipped with the right skills to meet the demands of industry, including skills needed for growing micro, small, and medium enterprises. The links in this regard between youth, skills, economic development in the industry cannot be overemphasized. <coughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, Africa presents an overwhelming investment potential However, I also note that in recent years, most developed countries are facing fiscal constraints, suggesting that official development assistance could, to a large extent, be unavailable or stagnant in the near future. Hence, there is an increased need to find other innovative ways of financing the continent's programs and projects. I know that you could be asking questions as to why on the continent of Africa that are so well endowed with natural resources cannot make better use of their natural resources to increase their revenue basis. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as I explained earlier, many of our countries on the continent are dependent on the extraction and the exploitation of raw materials with little value addition, and they have been faced with a slump in commodity prices, thus narrowing the fiscal space to undertake development projects. In view of this, there is a need to find other ways of financing development programs, such as use of the following. One, public private partnerships. 
two pension funds, three trust funds for capacity building purposes, and four diaspora remittances, and five climate finance or climate investment fund, global in, uh, environment fund, or green investment fund. And six, we need to pull our resources from regional institutions for implementation of regional projects. <coughs> At this juncture, allow me to conclude by inviting all the potential investors present here. I know that the majority are students, but you will be investors also uh, sooner or later. To take advantage of the continent's youthful age structure, growing population, increasing middle class, a good population of consumers, marked decline in conflict, peace and sustained economic growth, which makes the continent indeed a land of opportunities. This in recent years has been evidenced by a significant rise in the value of FDI inflows into Africa, the ones called the dark continents. I must say that the stigma of a dark continent was coined by people who did not know Africa. I wish to reiterate my call to Africans in the diaspora to make a difference and invest in Africa. While we welcome FDI, it is the homegrown investment solutions that will deliver sustainable development for all. It is regrettable that instead of investing in Africa and helping to develop economies therein, some people opt to keep their money in illicit bank accounts in places like Panama. <laughs> In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon the distinguished scholars and the researchers that are present to come up with solutions that will deliver inclusive economic growth and development. I also want to appeal to the investors and businesses operating in Africa to be responsible corporate citizens and be a part of the transformation to uplift the living standards of the people in their areas of operation with particular focus on youth and the women. On our part, as African governments, we recognize the potential of the youth in national development. And we are committed to play our part. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for that wonderful presentation. 
Um, there's a lot you said today, and um, if, a, a lot of things struck me, but I will deal with uh, what I find to be most intriguing, and that's the fact that uh, you've been such a powerful voice for girls and young women in Zambia, and indeed on the African continent. And um, you did say that we need it. Africa has such a huge human capital um, base, and we, we need to harness this. So I was thinking, in, all, in, in view of all that we've done, what efforts are now required to meet the international agreed targets to increase women's participation in politics? Because in as much as we have to harness the great potential we have in human capital, we also need women and young, young girls and women to be in a place of uh, influence, where they can influence policy. So uh, against that backdrop, what do you think we can do to increase the participation of women and young girls in politics so that they take a more active role? As governments, we need to do a lot. Um, first and foremost, we need to have that commitment to international standards on gender equality. Um, and agreeing to those conventions, we need to domesticate them so that they are part uh, and parcel of our national laws. Apart from that, it may not be good to just adopt a policy without having an implementation plan for it. So it's important for governments uh, and also political parties in our countries to implement um, uh, these international agreements so that they become part of our development agenda, uh, including the uh, promotion of women in decision making in particular and all other areas of development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I was going to ask, what are some of the challenges you see before us in achieving this? We have, um, as you know, the, the cultural context of Africa is very unique, even though I like to say that Africa is not at all culturally homogeneous. I mean, it's Libya, it's Zambia, it's Nigeria, it's South Africa. But um, there are elements of shared cultural symbolism, which I think run through much of the continent. And um, given your experience with gender issues and your expertise, what do you think are some of the challenges we can walk through in order to reach that place where we have 50, 50 at least, or close, participation women? Um, challenges that women face around the world, in Africa and in Zambia in particular, are not peculiar to, to, to Africa only. Um, you find this, the same situation may prevail in another country outside Africa. And um, these are usually, the challenges are usually tied to the cultural norms yes. under which uh, we raise our children as people. That's right. Um, where the girl child is relegated to a second class person, even in a home. Um, where the boy child is elevated to a superhero at an early age. Indeed. Well, Indeed. these are reinforcing uh, the gender equality yes. issues later on as children grow up. Um, and in Africa in particular, where a girl uh, culturally was supposed to be a mother, uh, to be a housewife, to be um, a subordinate of somebody, so a child grow, grows with that uh, uh, perspective yes. um, in their heads that they will not come out of the home. After all, they are destined to be in the house home, house. to be in the kitchen, to be a housewife. So they do not see their position um, in the public arena. Uh, so as relevant. Yeah, as relevant uh, in their lives. So this is a challenge that needs to be overcome by parents, schools, uh, the families, as well as governments.
So are we looking at some form of empowerment of girls and young women, mental and moral empowerment of girls and young women to take a more active role in issues that concern them, both at the home level and at national level, even as young as school age? Do you, do you think this is something we need to work towards? This is extremely important um, because once a child, a girl child has been empowered, um, the child has, is assertive, then they'll be able to uh, voice out on issues that affect them, that affect their families, that affect the community at large. So empowering a young woman is cardinal. I notice here, for example, that the leadership at uh, LSE uh, is in That's the right. hands of these women, <laughs> these young women, very inspiring, very courageous, uh, who have defied the norms of culture. Indeed. <laughs> and uh, have uh, uh, aspired to, to have their voices heard um, in the global world. I think this is fantastic. This is the way to go. Thank you very much. You're such a powerful role model for young women and uh, women and young girls in Zambia. And so I think that alone is powerful imagery that would help in shifting, making that paradigm shift. Because at the end of the day, we think of how do we um, balance this expectation against those deeply instilled cultural norms that are in us. Because you may have a question, a situation where they are shifting and competing identities. Someone is raised in a particular way. And then we also have to shift that paradigm so that they can take their place in society. What, what sort of tensions do you see within our communities, you know, challenging this already established way of life? I think a lot of uh, uh, forces are at work. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, economic forces, for example. Yes, indeed. Where a woman is also a wage earner. Um, is having an impact on family relations in yes, the home, yes, yes. where a husband may accept the status this of true. this new woman. This is true. Um, again, uh, at the political level, uh, situations where women are elevated to higher positions of decision making also is changing the, the perception of a woman in the kitchen. Mm. And uh, luckily, a lot of men now in Zambia are accepting uh, the new woman, the new woman <laughs> which is uh, very positive in my view. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much for this. And uh, with that, we've come to the end of the session. I'd like to thank you very much for coming to be with us at the LSC. And uh, I wish you come back again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, please. Thank you.